Hey everybody, welcome to the Echoes and Curves Free Motion Challenge check-in live. I had some little birdies just pop in and start chirping right behind me, so hopefully that doesn't get too distracting. Um, I was enjoying reading the questions and I kind of lost track of time and I thought, oh my gosh, we got to get this thing started, see how you guys are going, how everything's going for you all. Um, thank you. I'm just going to pop in real quick, make sure that it's good. Fantastic. I hope you all are doing well and staying safe out there. I hope that um, safe and safe and sane, um, crazy times for sure. But what I love about quilting is it is truly my therapy and even teaching quilting, I love to do that even more than quilting itself. So thank you for joining me with the challenge and today and thanks for all the great questions. I can't wait to answer them. Um, so far in the free motion challenge, we've worked, we've worked through two different lessons. We learned the serpentine line by itself and then we've also saw how to turn the corner and do some variations. And I am so proud of everybody that's been posting pictures and, you know, really kind of cheering each other on. I'm going to admit, I was just a little nervous with the serpentine line because I love it, but I know that not everybody loves it as much as I do. So I'm proud of everybody for jumping in there and going, going for it. So what we're going to do is a quick little picture presentation. I'm going to show you some photos, talk through what we've learned, and then I'll come back and answer some of the questions that have been asked and then I'll kind of poke in or peek in on the, uh, on the chat and see if I can't answer any of those questions. So um, let's get started with the pictures. All right, so first in the very first video, if you've already watched it, you've seen this, we've talked about the basic, you know, the regular serpentine line within this section right here. And the thing about the serpentine line is it's really easy to teach. It's a, it's a design that is pretty basic in how it goes together. It's the application of it that can get just a little tricky. So um, as a part of the video, we showed some troubleshooting or I showed some troubleshooting options. So let's talk about some of those troubleshooting things. So the first one, if you watch the video, maybe you remember this, it's technically correct, right? It has that beautiful curve. It goes from one side to the other. But if you remember that the reason it, the reason it doesn't look quite perfect or you know ideal is that one side isn't extending past the other. So remember, when we're quilting those serpentine lines, we really want it to extend out in front of, either way, up, ahead, or down, but they really need to be kind of angled. Um, that's what's gonna help give it that elongated, kind of beautiful, elegant look. Um, another thing that commonly happens is we maybe we add too many curves to our, our serpentine line. Now, it's kind of funny because when we were doing the border challenge and we had that wavy, wavy design, does anybody remember that? Um, we wanted waves. We wanted all that beautiful texture, but here we don't. We just want one change of direction. We want to curve out, change, and then curve back in. So if you're seeing something like this, that's perfect for a wavy border design, but for the serpentine line, we want to have it nice and smooth. And I will say that um, if you're making any of these common frustrations, congratulations, you're completely normal. I've taught enough classes and answered enough questions that I know that these are the common things that everybody, um, that everybody kind of, not everybody, that most quilters have seen from time to time. And then the last one where we start to get it all kind of figured out, but it looks just a little different. Well, this is the uh, troubleshooting thing here would be keeping the spacing consistent. So we have some that are closer, some that are further. And so you're almost there. It's just keeping the, uh, Oh my gosh, Anita, Anitra, I've just, I just glanced at your chat. Too many curves, just like me. I'm sorry, that is hilarious. Um, anyway, sorry, easily distracted. Uh, keeping the spacing consistent is what's gonna help give you a beautiful texture. With, with this particular design, we don't want the, indi in general, I don't want the individual lines um, showing up. I want just to see everything, that whole overall texture. And so if you do this, it's not the end of the world, um, it's just, if you want it to look more like a, you know, a serpentine line, keeping that spacing consistent. But here is the bad part where I tell you that it comes with practice. So if you're working on these, just know it's gonna come with practice. The more you do, the better it's gonna get. So just keep at it, keep at it. Um, all right, so then we learned about some variations in the second video. So you know, for the first time you know, in a while, this challenge is kind of building off the previous video. The last challenge we did, it was kind of like, you know, you can jump from block to block, but you know, we really have to have an idea of how to do the serpentine line before we can do variations. So 
work on the first uh, handouts, trace over the lines, practice, and then go ahead and, and then work through you know, the variations. And I really only showed a couple variations because I, I don't want to make it confusing or overwhelming. Um, I love all the variations, but I just try to pick two or three that I think could be pretty versatile. And this was the first one that we learned. I love how elegant it looks. It looks kind of like scroll work. I think it would look really pretty in a border around a main element or a fabric that you love. It kind of looks like a frame. Um, so really cool variations. And I'm gonna show you some more on actual quilts here in a second, but we also talked about how to turn the corner, right? So it's kind of like, oh, fun and games until the corner comes around. Uh, I hopefully in the video reassured you and, and told you, you know, look, if, if it doesn't look perfect, it's not supposed to. Just get it as close as you can and remember what side you have angled up. Now on the video, I have mentioned that I always like the outside of my block to be where the highest part of the line is. So I kind of go from the inside and then heading up to the outside. There's no reason for that. It's just how I do it. It would have worked just as well the other way. I just didn't want to show two options and confuse everybody. So just if you already have a way that you like to do it, then just go ahead and do it the way you like. Um, the idea here is if you have a routine or a method that works for you, it's going to make it so much easier. So um, having kind of in your mind which one's going to be higher and which one's going to be lower is really, really going to help. Um, now let's look at some of the variations or here another picture of the variations in turning the corner a little bit more um, backed up there but I love to show these on actual quilts because it's you know it's one thing to know how to quilt a design it's a totally different thing to know where to use it so let's look at this example um, I use the serpentine lines because it was two inch strip I love those jelly rolls those pre-cut quilts for this reason. It's perfect for serpentine lines. And in this particular example, this block, the outer block, works its way all the way around, even though there's different fabrics in it. And you know, it's funny because normally I would say if there's two different fabrics, I would normally quilt them each differently. But this particular example, I don't know, maybe I was just in the mood to work my way around. So in this particular example, I quilted the serpentine lines so that they wrapped around, turned the corner with them. Looks like the one on the bottom, I did a better job than the one on the left, but you know, you just keep on going and moving around. And by the way, you're not allowed to point out your mistakes. I can, because it's my job, but just to reassure you that I not only quilted that kind of weird, I also, this is a customer's quilt, so I also took their money for it. So there you go, there's that. So in this particular example, I wanted the serpentine lines to curve around. I wanted it to, you know, kind of have that framing kind of look. And up here we can see a little bit closer turning the corner and working our way around but not every block that you quilt serpentine lines you're going to want to do that maybe you want it to be more of a motif or more, more of a, a central element and in this particular block i mean it, it's a log cabin block but it makes a beautiful kind of flower shape and so it wouldn't have been horrible to turn the corner but i just kind of like the idea how having that little different thing in the middle remember we talked about that adding just a little leaf shape or something and then quilting the serpentine lines out just I felt like gave it a more of a motif kind of look kind of um, really just kind of pulls it together and it could be easier too if you're having trouble working on on the um, if you're having trouble working around that corner it might really help you just to do it this way so you just have to kind of definitely fit within your preferences but this is another example. If you love the serpentine line and you're like, oh, I just, but I can't turn the corner and I, I'm just going to do something completely different in this quilt, that's exactly what I did. Um, so this one is the Campfire Quilt. This is a Midnight Quilt Show episode. And in these strips, they were two inches and I think there was even one that was like one inch, that one up there up towards the top, the light blue. Uh, you know, it, I could have turned the corner, but maybe, I don't know, I was in a rush. I've got to get these quilts done in five minutes, right? <laughs> so doing a different design in the corner makes it a little bit easier. So definitely when it comes to those corners, don't fight it. Just find what you like and make it easier and just go on. And if you're thinking, I don't know what I like, well, just try something. And, you know, whichever one makes you feel less like throwing up, that's probably the one you should stick with. And then as you get better, you know, you can kind of uh, continue on. So in this particular example, 
You don't have to quilt it so that it wraps around. You can do something completely different. And then here's that variation that we saw in the video. You can kind of see it right here where we do some serpentine lines and throw a little something different inside. This is really great if you're just kind of practicing flipping both directions, right? So it's, this is going to be a little trickier because I'm quilting it one direction and then I'm flipping it to the other way. And so sometimes that mirror image does make it tricky. It's kind of like, I got it. I don't got it. I got it. I don't got it. And I know that isn't technical English, but you know what I'm saying, right? So this is a great way to practice. And then once you get the hang of it, it is a beautiful design. It's going to be less dense. It's going to, you know, kind of more minimalistic, or maybe you just want to do something different because you've been doing serpentine lines and you can't think of anything else to do. So definitely try those variations. And this particular one is out of order, but it's just turning the corner with the serpentine line. When you're going to practice this technique, get a busier fabric. That's the perfect place because, you know, even if you, even if it doesn't look good, it's, it's still going to blend in and you're not going to be able to tell. All right, but when it comes to the variations, think about what they look like when they're next to each other. So in this particular strip, right, so we've already seen this serpentine line, something different right here in the center, and then not turning the corner. But then when all four of those strips come together, it kind of makes a motif in the center. And this is what I love about quilting. One design right by itself can look kind of basic, but when you you know put it next to other uh, put it next to itself or create an arrangement, you can get some really intricate uh, looking kind of designs. So really look at your quilts and think about, ooh, what, what would happen if I did this again and again and again? It's just going to make it easier on you, but also look really impactful. And, and honestly, isn't that like the goal to do the best, most impactful quilting we can, but in an easier short amount of time and a little bit up close here. So this is actually a little bit different because it's kind of working us into a plume feather, which we're going to see next week. I can't wait. Um, but you can kind of tell how when they come together, they really just look kind of cute, like a, little, like a little plume feather. So think about uh, different directions and, and the secondary motifs you can make. And again, you can see that little center bit and the consistent spacing really helps there too. All right. Now, when we talked about the serpentine line, doing them in groups, this is the Shattered Frames quilt. There's, this is actually a free quilt pattern on my website. But what I also love about serpentine lines is they allow you to break up larger areas. So if this seems too, too confusing, then just ignore me for a second. But for those of you that have worked through the borders challenge, and we talked about how do you handle longer borders, breaking them up makes them easier to manage, right? So on this quilt, if I wanted to quilt straight lines, all the way around this big area, I could do that, but it's not super efficient. But if I throw a couple groupings of serpentine lines in there, it's going to give me a smaller area to work within. So I just love how it contrasts with the straight lines, but it also makes it a little bit easier, more efficient for me. So when you're quilting those serpentine lines, it doesn't have to just be a border design. You can use it to break up. You can also combine it with other designs. And also this is a great way to practice just quilting three or four of them until you feel like, you know, that's, that's not very, you know, that's making me nervous. So then you can switch to something else. So definitely uh, don't get overwhelmed by them. You can definitely switch them up and come up with, you know, different, different ways that you want to put them together. So that's kind of where we ended or what we've covered in the last two weeks. Um, I know the thing about videos, especially the uh, challenge videos, is I do try to keep them concise, uh, not overwhelming. I try to throw in a few pointers, but just definitely mostly technique. But that's why I love the Q&A section, because this is where we can delve into things a little bit more detail or where, you know, we can make sure that you're understanding what I'm talking about. Uh, another thing I did for the challenge this time, I'm going to, well, I did it a couple times before, but extended videos. So I'm trying to leave a longer edit of the video just for, you know, you guys on uh, the challenge group, uh, challenge email, I send it out that way too. That way you can, if you want to watch the quilting a little bit more, you can. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I had this in-depth conversation with my 10 year old daughter about this. She likes longer videos. She likes to see all the details when she's looking at something and I like it nice and concise so I can go do it. So hopefully between the two, you can find something that will appeal to your learning style. So hopefully, hopefully you're liking those. 
All right, so I did get on the chat and I was asking, you know, kind of chatting like, hey, everybody, what questions do you have? So there's a few questions that I'm going to answer and then I'll skim through and then and answer some and then um, send you off to your quilting destiny. Okay, the first question that came up on the chat was about needle size. So the collection, the thread collection we're using is Glide Thread. It's a 40 weight thread that gets its sheen from the twist of the, the um, pies that make it up. So since it's a 40 weight thread, on a sewing machine, I either use an 80 or a 90 needle. So an 80, I had to write it down because numbers, 80, 12, or a 90, 14. I really love top stitch needles. The titanium coated, they're stronger, and if you're having trouble with shredding thread, it could be that you're not using the right size needle. You could go up a size. Um, if you're having trouble with, you know, it doesn't feel right, maybe you're bending the needle, pushing it a little, little weird, going too slow and pushing too hard. So you could try some of those, those two sizes, one of those two sizes as well as the titanium coated really helps. I will say that there is um, an assorted pack that you can check out. I have that for sale on my website, but an assorted pack of top stitch needles so that you can have just one of each size and see which one works for you. But ultimately the size needle that you use depends on the size of thread because the eye is gonna change the size of that. Now on a long arm with my glide thread, I use a 16 or an 18. So that covers the 40, uh, it kind of covers that, those two needles both work for the 40 weight but just those are the two that I kind of always use between my 50 weight thread and my 40 weight thread. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, Sherry Bruno had a great question. She said, if I had to only use one thread color on the challenge quilt, which color would I use? So when you're doing one thread, that's perfect. I always like to go for a neutral that is in the value of the quilt. So a neutral would be um, like a light tan a, a, or a tan, a yellow, a cream, something like that and for this quilt I would go with bone so bone isn't a white white it's more like a I don't I can't describe it I don't and I was looking for a cone so I could show you but I don't have any here in my office so just a light light gray um, and normally I love yellow as my overall color but since this quilt has so many cool tones I thought gray would be a better option so just a light light uh, light light blue would look amazing too or a cream or cream would work too uh, the thing is, when I'm picking thread colors, though, I'm always kind of looking at that thread on all different parts of the quilt, and then I would rather have a lighter thread on darker fabric than a darker thread on lighter fabric. So, but the great thing about thread choice is it's it's a personal preference. You just try them out and see what you like. Um, but that's definitely the color I would suggest for that one. And hey, I am the expert in my opinion, so that works out. Another question that was that came up was how often do I take a break when long arming? Honestly, I don't usually dictate my breaks when I'm long arming. The people in my family usually do. So, as long as you know the kids are occupied and I can quilt for a couple hours without stopping, I love it. I get into the zone. I'm on my sewing machine or my long arm. I could just go, go, go. So, usually I don't get to quilt quite that long though before I get interrupted. Um, bobbin questions, lots of bobbin questions about the thread. So let's talk about glide. <clears throat> let's talk about glide and bobbin thread. So glide being that poly, it's a little slicker, gives it that sheen, really pretty. Um, but if you're winding it on your bobbin, you're gonna need to wind slower and sometimes just help holding the thread as it feeds in will help it wind more evenly. No matter what thread you wind on your bobbin, it needs to be a consistent wind. It needs to be nice and compact, no squishy bobbins. That's just gonna be a recipe for, for misery. So wind slower, sometimes maybe even using your hand to kind of feed it through, um, even on a long arm sometimes. But I will be honest with you, I have become really addicted to pre-wounds. Uh, it's, I almost kind of feel bad, but I love them. So on my long arm, I use the Glide brand, the um, Magna Glide bobbins and they have like a little magnetic core and then even on my sewing machine I've really let's see I don't know if you can see this but I've gotten really addicted to the pre-wounds just a little bobbin with the gray thread so I just use the same gray on all of it however if I were not using pre-wounds if I were not addicted to them as much as I am and I always like to say they're kind of like drugs so if somebody offers you one just say no because next thing you'll know you'll be hooked and you'll have pre-wounds and all the colors um, but if, you, if I wasn't using pre-wounds, then I would match the thread color to the bobbin, bobbin thread color to the top thread. What it's gonna do is it's gonna help give you, 
less, I don't know. If you have two different thread colors, that keeping that tension perfect is gonna be tricky. And so having the same thread color on top and bottom just kind of helps you not exactly see if the tension isn't perfect, you know. It keeps that thread from poking up on the top or the bottom and it does save a lot of headaches. So um, with the pre-wounds, since that's what I'm using, I just pick a neutral color in the value that I'm using on the top. So if I'm working with the um, Persian, that beautiful dark blue that's part of the thread collection, I'm gonna do a darker gray for the bottom. That's just gonna kind of keep it similar. Um, but that, again, that's a, get a personal preference. So take it for what it's worth, but experiment and find what you like. I could talk about threads all day long. Those are my favorites. Okay, uh, another great, great question. Uh, do I suggest starting from the top or the bottom of the serpentine line? It doesn't matter. In the beginning, it's all gonna feel weird. So just start wherever you feel comfortable. Just pick a place and just start and kind of develop that. But once you get comfortable with the design and you're using it a lot on quilts, you're just gonna start wherever you end up, right? So if I happen to work my way through a quilt and end up at the top of a block, then I'm just gonna start from the top. But being able to go you know, either way is gonna really help make it a little bit more efficient. Now, like I said, on a sewing machine, we, you have a little bit more of a, you know, you can twist the quilt, you can change the orientation, so you can make it a little bit easier. But for those of you and me on a long arm, we're gonna have to learn how to do it in every different direction because we can't really change the orientation of the quilt super easy. So it doesn't matter which side you start from, um, but getting comfortable with all sides will definitely help. Okay, another question stock talks about stitching in the ditch with the serpentine lines. So if you remember from the video, when we're stitching uh, or quilting the serpentine line, we're traveling just a bit along the edge of that seam and then coming back, right? So if we were to look at that without the seams, we'd see these little unquilted areas. I like stitching in the ditch, so I come back either, I either do it before or after, doesn't matter. I'll stitch along the seam and then quilt my serpentine lines. And that means I'll have some areas that have two lines of quilting on top of each other. Now, I'm okay with that. That's also why I like using a 50 weight or a 40 weight thread, it's a little thinner. But if you don't like the look of it, you can definitely skip the stitching in the ditch. It's, that's also a personal preference. So just uh, depends on how big of a rush you're in, you know, how much you love the person you're quilting it for, all these things. So, um, okay, so I see a lot of questions about the, the uh, pre-wounds. Okay, so the pre-wounds that I buy for my machine, my machine is an M bobbin, uh, my long arm. So I buy the pre-wound M size bobbins. I don't know how it works with Bernina's giant bobbin. Probably not. I don't know. You would have to check with your dealer um, and, and check on that. Now, on the sewing machine, they're not specific to a sewing machine brand. These particular ones, and I'm going to put them on my website because I, I love them so much. I just bought some if you guys want to check it out. I'll put a link in the description box later. They're class 15. Now, my sewing machine, I have an HQ stitch, which uses plastic drop-in bobbins. So that works for that. I'll do a little research and see if I can't put together some kind of list but it's just uh, not brand specific, but it is size of bobbin specific. So I'll, I'll try to help you out with that. Um, okay, question. I love this question, Joyce. I have black and white blocks with neon green strips separating them. What color thread should I use? So if you're using one thread color over that whole quilt, right? So then I would think, all right, I would probably aim for a black, or I'm sorry, not black, gray, medium to light medium gray. Now that means a gray is gonna show up on the white and it's gonna show up on the black, but it's not gonna be too extreme on either one. It's gonna kind of split the difference. But let's say you loved the green, the neon green, like that's your favorite color. I think some neon green thread would look awesome. So it, it really just depends on, I don't know, what you like and what your favorite thing is about the quilt. So great example of that. Um, oh, good question. In the pictures of the finished quilt, I'm showing areas of stitching the ditch that I'm not covering yet in your lesson. Yeah, go ahead and do that as you go. Um, you can stitch in the ditch all before. We're gonna talk about something kind of like that in a second, or you can do it afterwards. I'll maybe I'll try to put more pointers about that in the quilting diagrams, give you a little bit more uh, information. Okay, uh, good. I had a couple questions about starting in the center of the challenge. So with this quilt, I really struggled. I did, y'all, because I was trying to think, how could we do this? For the long armors <laughs> because I, I'm having the same struggle, right? I'm quilting in the long arm and it's not fun starting from the center of the quilt on your long arm. So for those of you, I know Vicki asked this question, um, you know, 
she started in the center and now she's got borders and she didn't she didn't say she was on a long arm so maybe she's not but it did make, make me think of long armers if you're on a long arm you can't just advance to the center and get started you have to stabilize all the area ahead i know that's a pain so you could either wait until the challenge videos are over and then do it all at once working from top down um, or you can stabilize everything and then you can come back and forth now stitching in the ditch is a great stabilizer so you could do that I use big uh, corsage pins to stabilize the area. I just pin them parallel to my bars so they can roll up. Um, and so I know it's kind of a pain for the long armors, but you know I, I couldn't figure out a way around that. Uh, Connie, one of my long arm owners, nice to see you on here, Connie. Hope you're having fun, staying safe. She's, she's tackling it. She's starting on her long arm, but she's having trouble loading and unloading it. So if you do you know, take it off your frame each week, which I would, I would do, I wouldn't wanna leave that quilt on my frame. I would wanna quilt other stuff. Um, clamps are really helpful. So getting clamps for your machine, there's long plastic clamps so that you can just throw that quilt sandwich back on there, clamp it, and you don't have to pin it. Connie, if you have questions about that, just email me or text me and we'll, we'll go into more detail about that. Um, more questions about pre-wounds. The, the pre-wounds that I use are 60 weight, um, but they do sell 40 weight as well. So as far as um, glide thread is, going, is concerned, if they match the glide color um, perfectly, they're 40 weight. If they're just a magna glide, then they're 60 weight, and it should specify in there. 60 weight is nice because since I'm not matching that thread color to the top, it's gonna help kind of let it blend in a little bit more. So, but if you like turning the quilt over and seeing the, the beautiful back of it, then you know go with the 40 weight so that you can see that beautiful quilting. Okay. Somebody asked, let's see if I can figure this out real quick. Okay, to see the back of my quilt. So I have it over here. You're all gonna be disappointed. Don't be disappointed in me. First of all, it's not bound. Second of all, I don't have the backing fabric because I used the strike off or the first um, thing that came off of the, the printer so that I could get started on the video. So the backing is just a gray print. You can't see it, but it has like a little raindrops on it. I'll put a picture of it on the next quilting diagram so that you can see it. So I know it's not super you know, fun or interesting, but that's just the back of it. Now, a question came up, and I thought this is great. What batting did I use? Dr. Morrow asked this. What batting did I use? Normally, I use Quilter's Dream Poly Select. Right? That's my favorite. Quilter's Dream Poly Select has a nice drape. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't crease. It's, it's not a poly like you might be thinking. It's beautiful. I love it. And um, I actually saw some on the website. But I've noticed that for the challenge, pictures. If I use a different type of batting or different filler, I get just a much better look, more definition, and the pictures look great. And it's easier for you to see what I'm doing. So this is actually quilted with soft and stable, which is like the, um, that foamy kind of, I know you can't see this because it's too far away. It's like a foamy thing for bags. Oh man, it makes it look just, makes that quilting pop off of there. It's not super cuddly though, so definitely don't do that for you know a bed quilt or anything like that, but it definitely lets it. Uh... Um, okay, so end on the batting question. That's what I normally use, but I use something a little bit different in case you're wondering about that puff. Susan, yes, if there's a reason I showed you how to do serpentine lines on the panel from the last challenge instead of sticking with the current panel. I wanted to show you several different variation options, and I didn't think I would have enough time to work through all the tips in between corners. So if I was filming the video, I would have to say, here's you know, one variation, and now let's turn the corner. And then now here's a second variation, and I just thought the editing would be a lot more labor intensive. So I thought, I'll just use this straight line right here that you can see, so that's, that's why I did that. It was a little bit easier for me. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes I uh, take the easy route. Okay, let me see. Gosh, 30 minutes just flies by, it's crazy. Um, any, let me see, any other questions I missed? I wrote them down, glance over here. Um, thoughts on spray adhesive? I like it, I would use it. I try to use the fusible batting though, just so I don't have to deal with the spray. Whatever is easier, I'm all about that. Um, Kathy said, can you use 60 weight in the bod bobbin and 40 in the top? Yes, you can. You can mix thread colors, thread types, thread weights. You can, they're all interchangeable. You do have to make tension adjustments though. So for me, I try to stick with the same kind of weight in the bobbin all the time so I don't have to make adjustments. 
And on the top, I, I kind of alternate between 40 and 50 weight, so I don't have to make a lot of adjustments there. But you can definitely do that. Um, Nancy, can I show you a picture of using a serpentine line in a star block? I'll make a note of that, and I'll include it in the handouts uh, star block. I have to make notes anymore. Am I the only one? Weird. Okay, so time flies. Went by really fast. I know I didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, if you have any specific questions, leave them in the comment section of the video after it ends. So the live chat's going to go away, and I'm not going to be able to see what you did. So come back to the video later, leave your question in the comments, or join the Facebook group if you want. That's a great place to ask questions as well. And um, next week, we're going to be learning the plume feather. So I'm excited about that. We're going to see how to make this kind of motif look and, and some fun variations. And as a quick recap, a quick different topic here, um, those of you that did the layered challenge with me that was kind of last year, remember we made the layered pieces? I did put an update video with some things to do with your layered piece. So that was something I was supposed to post a long time ago, but I finally got around to it. So on the, on the uh, YouTube channel, show you how to take those layered quilted pieces and, and included instructions on making a cute tote bag or a fun pillow. So you can definitely make some stuff with that quilted piece you might have laying around. If you haven't taken that challenge, it's a fun way to use those bold prints and it's a lot of uh, cutting and, and uh, quilting, so a lot of great fun. Okay, you all, this has been so much fun. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll see you at the next video, which will come out on Friday about the plume feather. And of course, leave questions on this video if you have any of them. Thank you so much. Stay safe and happy quilting.